J.J. Abrams, tell me, uh, who do you think you are? J.J. Abrams, uh, said what? You're never gonna get my dough, oh yeah! What's up, guys? This is the Gospel According to Mark with a C. He is I, and I am he. Just taking some time to tell you what's on my motherfucking mind. And guys, you know, a couple of days ago, I saw this article, and it got my mind kind of like twirling around, right? Because I never saw anything like this, so I figured I would take it to the people, and I would ask you guys, um, listen, I got a question. Serious cancer. And that question is, um, with the release of new comic books, since when do they have trailers? Like when a new comic book is coming out, because I've been away from collecting for a while. I used to collect back in the day, you know what I mean? And um, I used to love collecting, man. Especially like the old school comics, man. I love the, the smell of the paper and the feel and the fabric. And when I was reading them, I loved to just rub it all over my body, you know what I'm saying? But um, I've been out the game for a while. So maybe this is something that, that just happens now, you know what I mean? Maybe this is how we're getting down. You guys tell me. But, yes, when a new comic comes out, is there usually a trailer that's released in anticipation of this? Or is this something that just happens with J.J. Abrams and his son Henry? All right, because that's what I saw a couple of days ago. It's like I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through, I'm minding my own business, not bothering anybody. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Ah! It said, new trailer uh, for Spider-Man, not film, but comic by J.J. Abrams and son like Sanford and son JJ Abrams and his son Henry they're doing a new Spider-Man comic you big dummy yes and this was on let me see if I can bring it up real quick guys where is it oh there it is okay this was on the Mary Sue, Mary Sue, m m m m m m m Mary Sue, Mary Sue, I'm my Mary Sue. All right, and MarySue.com. Of course, I'm going to leave the link in the description box so you can take your fly ass over there if you want to read it. All right, I'm going to read it here, though. And it says here, the trailer for J.J. Abrams' Spider-Man comic book is here, and you don't deserve it. Okay, it says Rachel, all right, this is by Rachel Leishman. Okay, so it says here, J.J. Abrams is taking on the world of Spider-Man with his son in tow, teaming up with Henry Abrams, my God, there's another one of them, and Sarah Pacelli. The comic book is apparently focused on the struggle of Peter Parker's life behind the mask. We're going behind the mask, like VH1's Behind the Music. We're going behind the mask. It seems as if the new Abrams X2 series is taking a turn and giving Peter Parker a bit more of the spotlight rather than Spider-Man himself. What, is this fucking new? Is this some shit that we never saw before? Spider-Man and Peter Parker have always been like kind of equally represented on the page, but shh, don't tell this to these people. The, these SJWs are like, they're like Christopher Columbus, you know what I mean? They go into the so-called new world that was there already, and they plant their flag and say, I claim this for me, even though the Indians are like, the fuck this motherfucker talking about, you know what I mean? But okay, we go on. Sitting side by side, while images from their new book appear, J.J. Abrams and Henry Abrams share the new trailer for Spider-Man number one. How are you going to call it Spider-Man number one? Todd McFarlane did Spider-Man number one way back. Guys, where are my hardcore collectors at? How many people out there have the gold metallic cover of Spider-Man number one? How many people have the silver one? How many people have the, the black one? How many people have the regular one? How many people have the red one? There was a lot of them, you know what I mean? And I didn't have all of them, but I did have most of them. Oh yes, a brother did, you know what I mean? But anyway, that was Spider-Man number one. So once again, J.J. Abrams and his son, Junior, come out and they're gonna just name it Spider-Man number one as if Spider-Man number one was never there before, but okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> uh, JJ and Henry Abrams share the new trailer for Spider-Man number one to get us excited about the journey that Abrams and, well, Abrams plan to take our favorite boy from Queens on. 
Let me, I'm a boy from Queens too. Queens, stand up and where my Queens heads at, New York. All right. The miniseries will be illustrated by Sarah Pacelli. What interests me the most about the trailer is that they're taking on a Peter Parker story that is more about Peter Parker behind the mask. I get behind the groove. To keep better get on up by behind the groove. Come to the party behind the groove. Open up and let the music in. To get behind the groove. You better get on up by behind the groove. Shake your body behind the groove. Love is what you've been waiting for. I don't know. Uh, rest in peace, Tina Marie. Behind the groove. All right. For me, it has always been a story about Peter Parker living up to the expectations of what it means to be Spider-Man, Spider-Man. A trait then incorporated into Miles Morales, Gwen Stacy, and everyone else who took it on. They were often overwhelmed by what it meant to be Spider-Man, with that great responsibility often coming before their own well-being. So I have to agree with the point that Henry Abrams makes, where he says that it's going to be an interesting dynamic to explore. We saw a bit of it in Spider-Man Far From Home, uh, with Peter Parker wanting to be selfish and just be the high school kid that he should be, but still, the mask came first, and he always did the right thing. The mask came first, the ma they're acting like this dude is just, like, obsessed with the mask. He's just, like, walking across the bedroom and he just sees the mask and he's like, must put on the mask. <laughs> that should be calling me, man. Look. You know, it's funny because all of the Spider-Man movies that came out, most of them retold the origin story of Spider-Man, you know, where he is um, haunted by the fact that he allowed the would-be murderer of his beloved Uncle Ben to go, all right? And he had a chance to stop him, but this guy ended up killing his uncle, you know? And here he has these, these new powers and everything, and he's just taking them for granted. He's just being arrogant and shit, you know what I mean? But then his uncle gets killed, leaving his elderly aunt. Yes, I said his elderly aunt, all right? Because these new Spider-Man things out here, the new Spider-Man films, it's like Aunt May is like a, she's like a MILF, or she's a GILF, you know, a grandmother that I like to, all right? But really, Aunt May, part of what drives Peter Parker is not just the fact that Uncle Ben got killed when he could have prevented it, but because he could have prevented it and didn't prevent it, and now Uncle Ben is dead, now his frail, elderly Aunt May is left to fend for his, herself. You know what I mean? So it's like this adds to his burden. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's like it's more than just he has to serve the mask. The mask is calling me. No, no. There's much more to the dynamic between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. You know, and I wonder if the younger audiences know that now because of the way it's been presented in these new Spider-Man films. You know, I, I don't know. And then it says here, apparently Abrams has been asked for a while to come up with a story for Peter Parker and it worked out perfectly that he and his son had an idea for the web slinger. And then J.J. Um, Abrams goes on to say, Nick had been pressing me to do a book with him. A year or so ago, I started talking about it with Henry, and it sort of happened organically. And that has been the joy of this, even though I've been talking to Nick for a long time. Weirdly, this feels like it just sort of evolved from the conversations of Henry and I having ideas that got us ooh, so excited, and Nick being open to the nepotism, or I mean, the collaboration. I never really imagined J.J. Abrams as a Spider-Man loving guy. Me neither, buddy. But here we are, and I trust him enough to have him tackle Peter Parker. I'm actually really excited about Spider-Man number one, maybe because I'm a sucker. I mean, maybe because I'm a sucker for all things Spider-Man and his struggles. I can't wait to see what Abrams and Abrams and Pacelli have on offer. Oh, ooh, it's so exciting. You know something, guys? This is all well and good. But when I first saw the article, for some reason, I felt a strange sensation. You know, it started like like deep down inside. And then it started to rise up in me. And I started to I started to see red and I started breathing <sighs> heavy, you know what I mean? And I couldn't quite figure out why I was starting to get so fucking pissed off about this. And, you know, <sighs> upon reflection, it came to me. This idea of a Hollywood bigwig, all right, or someone who's trying to be a Hollywood bigwig, like just 
tackling an established legend, you know, a modern day myth, you know, hoping to put their own personal stamp on it and their own personal claim on it. You know, it occurred to me, isn't this what kind of like what J.J. Abrams did with Star Trek and Star Wars, you know, and Ryan Johnson, you know, what he did with Star Wars? I mean, the way I see it, these outsiders are coming into our house as geeks, all right? And they're using our characters and our legends and the things we love. They're using them as vanity projects. It, yes, boom! You know what I mean? It just came to me, right? It's, it's vanity projects, you know? Like I saw this article a couple of weeks ago where the guy who plays uh, Bones in the Star Trek movie, what is it, Carl Urban or something? He was saying some shit like, I think that Quentin Tarantino should definitely get to do a Star Trek movie. And I'm like, definitely? Like, why? You know what I mean? Like, really? I like Quentin Tarantino, by the way. You know, love his movies and everything. To me, he's carved out his own little, you know, like little niche in, in Hollywood. You know a Tarantino movie when you see it, you know? Um, but that's what he does, you know? So when I see these people, like, going away from what they do, like I like J.J. Abrams when he did Lost and all that stuff, all right? But when I see him getting into geek culture, you know, when I see Ryan Johnson fucking saying that even though everybody fucking hates his fucking guts, then I'm going to still do a Star Wars trilogy. You know, when I see Tarantino saying, I want to take a stab at Star Trek, like what on your resume leads me as someone who's been reading and watching Star Trek my entire life, what on your resume leads me to believe that you would do justice by Star Trek? J.J. Abrams, what on your resume would lead me to believe that you could do justice by Spider-Man? And definitely fucking Henry Abrams. You don't have a resume. You know what I mean? It's like you got this job because daddy gave you this job. He was just changing your diapers a fucking, what, like a, a little while ago. You know, but now you're going to inherit the earth. You know, you're just, I'm an Abrams. You will open up for me. You know what I mean? Like, dude. Do you realize if you don't do a good job with this, what it's going to mean for you? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, there's something inside of all of us that says, let's be fair. Let's see what these people are going to do. You know what I mean? But at the same time, these things are nothing more than vanity projects. As a matter of fact, Disney's acquisition of Star Wars has been nothing but a vanity project because Kathleen Kennedy has been using all of this for her own political trumpet. You know what I mean? It's about feminism. And if you don't like my vision of it, then you must be chauvinist. You must be misogynist. You must be a racist. You know what I'm saying? And in the meantime, the story suffers. For example, let me give you guys the uh, definition real quick and I'll wrap this shit up. All right. This is the definition of um, vanity project. I want to share this with you guys. Vanity projects or vanity productions are those creative works that are ostensibly showcases for someone's talent as an actor, director, writer, singer, and or composer, but fail, I said fail, miserably to achieve their goal. Let me read that again. Vanity projects or vanity productions are those creative works that are ostensibly showcases for someone's talents as an actor, director, writer, singer, and or composer, but fail miserably to achieve their goal. All right. That kind of fits the description of what I'm talking about here because ever since J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson and, uh, you know, whoever you can name, you know, started using these properties you know, for their own vanity, you know, for their own uh, political gain and all that shit. The results have been mixed, to say the least, all right? Hardcore fans have almost unanimously been rejecting these things, all right? Because they're not concerned with the history of them, the integrity of them. They're acting like we're just going to take it from here, you know? Where do you see what we do with it? It's almost like... Uh, uh, what's his name, Taika Wakuku? You know, he said, you don't know what you like until I give it to you, you fucking moron. You know, this is what I'm talking about. And so we're going to have Thor, love and thunder. You know, I don't think so, bruh. You know, but this is what we're dealing with. And, you know, the article with J.J. Abrams and his son, Henry, sure, I'm sure they're lovely people. You know, but not everybody deserves to be in our house. 
And that's what's going on these days. That's why the Phantom Menace makes the noise that it does. Even if you're someone who loves The Last Jedi, all right? And you're a fan. It's like, sooner or later, this shit is going to catch up to you, all right? Because these people are in where they don't belong. And that's the thing. If they belonged, then they would have more respect for the lore. They would have more respect for the, the legend, the myth, the story. But they're more concerned with redefining, you know? So um, that's how I feel about it, guys. Of course, you can get in the comment section and let me know, especially if you've picked up this book uh, when it comes out, I think, next month. It's like, let me know. Is it any good? You know, um, are you looking forward to it? You know, does the trailer get you more excited for it? Or does it, is it kind of like a put off? You know what I mean? Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing here? If not, that's cool. You can, you know, express your opinion. It's welcome in the comment section. Of course, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe. And uh, when you subscribe, of course, hit the notification bell. Make sure you're still subscribed. YouTube is all over the place, so I appreciate it. And of course, you can catch me on Twitter. I'm always there. All right, guys, that's it for now. This is the Gospel According to Mark with a C. I'll catch you on the next one. Rock on.